Caregiving can sometimes feel like an impossible struggle. Caregivers may be torn between taking care of loved ones and trying to maintain balance in life. The good news is that it doesn't have to be that way. The Caring Generation with host Pamela D. Wilson is here to focus on the conversation of caring. You're not alone. In fact, you're in exactly the right place to share stories and learn tips and resources to help you and your loved ones. So now, please welcome the host of The Caring Generation, Pamela D. Wilson. This is Pamela D. Wilson, caregiving expert, speaker, consultant, and guardian of the caring generation. The caring generation focuses on the conversation of caring, giving us permission to talk about aging, the challenges of caregiving, and everything in between. It's no surprise that needing care or becoming a caregiver changes everything. The caring generation is here to guide you along the journey to let you know that you're not alone. You are in exactly the right place to share stories and learn about caregiving programs and resources to help you and your loved ones plan for what's ahead. Invite your parents, spouses, family, friends, colleagues, coworkers, and everybody you know to listen to the show available on podcast apps worldwide. If you have a question or an idea for a future program, Share your idea with me by commenting on social media posts on my Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn channels. This week on the program, we are going to talk about holding on to the good things and creating more good in your life as a caregiver or as any adult. Now, if you are burned out or exhausted... You may think there isn't anything good about all the caregiving events happening in your life. I understand that because I have been there. It's easy to feel hopeless or frustrated with life. Although I can say I've been on the opposite side where amazing things have happened and I felt blessed and grateful. And this is really where I prefer to spend most of my days. So seeing both sides... The contrast between nothing good or everything good is something to consider. So stay with me while I share a couple of scenarios that relate to holding on to the good things and creating more good in your life. The first scenario to consider is that we are a product of life circumstances. So to change whatever it is we want to change, we, no one else, have to change our circumstances. We can all complain as much as we want, but complaining only reinforces feeling stuck in a less than ideal situation. So let's look at a variety of circumstances. We have the family and culture into which we are born. Then the neighborhood or area we live in, we can change this. The people we spend the most time with are part of our circumstances. Whether these people are our friends, people we work with, including the culture at work, or social groups or people that we hang out with. Again, all things over which we have a lot of control or more control than we think. Life circumstances that relate to becoming a caregiver or needing care are called social determinants of health. The abbreviation SDOH is terminology used by the healthcare system, but it's a concept that we all should know about so we can learn about more opportunities to hold on to good things, one of which is good health. It can be hard to understand a concept like good health or any idea out there if there's a lack of experience knowledge or context. And context is a description of a situation or a background that that relates to an idea. So let's look at good health as an example. First of all, think of a day when you were sick and you couldn't get out of bed and it lasted maybe for more than a couple of days. Then think of one of your best days when you feel healthy and strong and positive and everything in the world is right. Which would you rather have? I suspect that most people would say the healthy day. So unless a person is diagnosed at birth with a health condition, 
young people are usually healthy, strong adults. Now, some families have two, three, or even sometimes four generations living in the same household or a neighborhood. People from the very old, in their 90s, all the way down to newborn babies. So what we see is a range of healthy young people to older people who may truly have a lot of health problems. Across these 100 years of family life, you have babies, children in grade school, young adults in college, adults pursuing careers, couples having children, older adults dreaming of retirement, and sometimes grandparents helping raise grandchildren. Everybody across this family is balancing their lives and, and doing their best. But like the example of good health, the good things are relative depending on age, the life stage that you might be in, interests, and other factors. Think way back to your teens and 20s. What were some of the good things? Maybe getting your first job, having your first car, dating somebody that you really like that may have been super important to you. And today, no matter your age, what are the good things? It could be a job with steady income so that you can support your family, a living situation that has enough bedrooms for your children, or if you work from home, maybe an extra room for a home office. Maybe you appreciate having a reliable car so that you can get to work or take the kids to school. Or, you know, if you're retired, maybe you're looking at traveling. Holding on to a good thing. Maybe the relationship that you have with a partner or spouse that you're compatible with and share similar goals. If you're retired, maybe it's enjoying your grandchildren or gardening or playing golf every day. The wrench in any of these plans is facing a derailment or an obstacle. So a derailment is like that, that train that you hear or see about in the news that goes off the tracks and it causes damage to the people on the train or surrounding areas. For caregivers, derailment is usually a change in health of a loved one. It could even be a change in health for the caregiver. So holding on to the good things may mean remaining healthy and active instead of becoming dependent on other people for care or daily assistance. Or if somebody already has health problems, then holding on to good things may be maintaining a health condition and not having it worsen. Becoming sick is not always associated with aging. Believe it or not, being healthy and active can result in unintentional or unexpected injuries. Here's a couple of examples. Individuals who ski may need a knee or a hip replacement. Softball or baseball players may have a bad shoulder that they need attention. Anything can happen regardless of age or health status that brings up the idea of holding on to the good things. And I've seen this because I've worked in the field of caregiving and aging for over 20 years. People who are healthy one day are not. People who are alive one day don't wake up the next day. So all these good things in life come in different degrees and shapes and sizes. Let's talk about sports for again. So you were a good skier. You love skiing blacks and bumps and through the trees. But today, after a couple of surgeries, you've recovered, but you've set limits. And the blue slopes without the bumps become the really good things for you. Suppose, on the other hand, you're a young person taking care of aging parents with health problems, and you have no contrast in life between good health and bad health because you've always been healthy. In that case, it can be really challenging to understand why sick aging parents constantly complain. Maybe they have a negative attitude about life or feel hopeless. It's hard for a healthy person who has never been sick to put themselves in the position of somebody who may always feel terrible. Let's say you're caring for a parent with dementia. In that case, you definitely have no experience understanding why mom or dad keeps repeating the same information or maybe accuses you of doing things that you didn't do. 
Likewise, if you've had a parent who's had a heart attack or a hip replacement, it can be hard to understand why they struggle to walk and the pain that they experience from those conditions. Maybe your parents today get tired and they can't do the things they did before surgery. And you're thinking, well, how hard can it be? Well, it can be really hard. Contrasts and these unexpected life changes can turn into negative or fear-based behaviors by the people experiencing them if they can't position these in the mind as a positive experience or something to learn from or something to work through. And I want to share a parable which explains this idea that should make sense to almost anybody. So a mom and her baby ducks were swimming in a lake one summer day, and one of the baby ducks kind of swam off in his own direction, and he got his webbed foot caught in weeds, and he got stuck, and he couldn't get out. Now, none of the other ducks, mom didn't notice, siblings didn't notice, so they didn't come to the rescue. Instead, they all went on their way, way far across the lake, leaving this poor little baby duck struggling to free itself. So finally, after a couple hours, the baby duck got free from the weeds. But after this experience, that duck preferred to remain on the land instead of spending a lot of time swimming in the lake. And then one day, this duck sitting on land saw another young duck get stuck in the weeds. And the duck remembered how traumatic the experience was of struggling and being left behind and nobody paying attention and nobody noticing. And the duck thought he was going to like die there. So rather than sit and watch, this older duck went to rescue the younger duck. And after the rescue, the older and the younger duck became companions and they started spending more time on the lake. And the older duck realized that, wow, the lake wasn't such a scary place. So this is a lesson that shows us that negative life experiences of any type, small, big, medium size, they can significantly impact how we think, how we make choices, our beliefs in our ability to do something or to succeed, how we trust people, or even having the confidence to try something new or to solve a problem. So here are some examples of how this fear-based thinking can work. If you're a caregiver, how many of you have siblings and other people who are just jumping in to help you to care for aging parents or grandparents? Maybe you've asked and they have said no. So if you don't have anybody to help or people have said no to your requests, this may result in you being hesitant to ask anybody else for help because you believe that the answer you will receive is a no. The idea of being rejected, the fear of being rejected, not wanting to be rejected, can cause us, a person, to reject the idea that asking others for help or doing this one thing can turn out well or that it can succeed. Now, this may also lead you to believe that you as the caregiver has to do it all because there's nobody else out there who was ever going to help you. That is not true. Let's look at a work situation. Is your supervisor supportive at work if you need to take time off to take mom or dad to the doctor? Or is taking time off work frowned upon because people on your team or there's a perception that people who take time off are not committed to the company? Now, if this is true, this may make you feel like you don't fit into your team or the organization's culture. So your first thought may be, you know, I need to leave this job. I need to go look for another position where people are more supportive of me. But the question to ask is, are you supportive of other people in your workplace? Because what we give out, we get back. The key to ensure that we don't repeat a negative situation is to really think about it in depth. And I'll talk more about this in the second half of the program because changing thinking patterns is essential if you want to create more good in your life. Another example, are you a caregiver? Are you frantic running from here to there? You're constantly busy, no time for yourself. You're trying to hold on to these good things that you see 
like in the past, right? You see in the rear view mirror as parts of your previous life that you gave up to become a caregiver and you don't do these things today. So many caregivers that I know and meet let go of their dreams to finish college, work in a job where they can be promoted, get married, have children. And all this happens because there's so much to do. There's not enough time. And the bigger issue is there's no space to think. Having time to think actually is a very important caregiving activity. Because what happens is a lot of time is not devoted to think logically about the consequences of decisions that caregivers make. Instead, parents need help, grandma and grandpa need help, Caregivers jump in and they lack the experience or the foresight to see or consider the short and long-term effects on their lives until so much later when they are resentful and angry and unhappy. It's also true that families don't discuss health problems and the impact on caregivers and other family members. When parents assume that their children will be the caregivers without talking about it, this does result in a lot of high-stress, high-conflict situations that really don't have to happen. Decisions surrounding becoming a caregiver are really obvious. Unless the caregiver has been in a similar situation in the past and they have a sense of what this looks like in the future, positive or negative. Now, when we think of past decisions that we've made, how many times do we make a decision and we think, oh, gosh, I have this new information. If I knew this back then, I would have decided differently. So the ability to have the time to work through a decision and a process is a factor in creating more good things in our life. It's a factor in being more thoughtful. So let's take a short break. We're going to come back to talk about the complications of not knowing what we don't know that can really help us hold on to the good things and create more good things in our life. So on the topic of good things and good stuff, I'm Pamela D. Wilson, caregiving expert, advocate, and speaker. Visit my website, PamelaDWilson.com. You can access my online caregiving program. It's called How to Care for Aging Parents. There are over 160 episodes of this Caring Generation podcast. You'll find my caregiving library on my website, links to my online support group. It's on Facebook called The Caregiving Trap, and also links to my YouTube channel. You can find it at Pamela D. Wilson, Caregiving Expert. There are over 800 videos answering questions caregivers ask. So stay with me. I'll be right back with more good stuff. This is Pamela D. Wilson, caregiving expert. Visit my website, PamelaDWilson.com, for tips, support, articles, podcasts, online caregiver programs, access to videos, and more help for caregivers and aging adults. There's something for everyone, regardless of your age, at PamelaDWilson.com. In this part of the program, I want to talk about conceptual reasoning skills that can help you hold on to good things and create more good in life. So you might be wondering, what is that big word? What are conceptual reasoning skills? Well, this is a process of problem solving that means that you're going to pull experiences or knowledge from other areas in your life or from the lives of people that you know or from information that you research so that you can understand and make good or better decisions. So maybe when you have a problem, you talk to your grandparents or your parents, a teacher, a good friend, somebody else, because you've got a problem, you don't know how to solve it, you've never done this before. And if you don't have any experience doing something, it can really be challenging to know what to do or to even know what to expect if you make a certain choice. 
You can also do research. You can see how other people have approached a similar problem. The hidden challenge in conceptual reasoning is placing yourself in a position of trying to figure out this thing or how to do this thing that you want. And in the context of our discussion today, it's doing something you want that's positive so that you can get more of it and bring more good things in your life. Now, what you have to do, though, is you have to start doing the thing to get the thing. And I know this sounds totally backwards. And then it can take a little time to really wrap your head around, how can this possibly work? How can I do something that I don't have, right? Well, you can. Start by thinking about all the amazing good things in your life. Okay, so that's going to make you feel good. That should make you feel blessed. It should make you feel grateful. Feeling good, feeling blessed, feeling grateful is the path to creating more good gratefulness and blessings in your life. So what's good about your life today? And don't tell me nothing. Make a list, write it down. Express gratitude every day for some small things like, oh my gosh, I have food in the refrigerator or in the cabinet to eat for breakfast. I have clean clothing to wear today. I have drinking water. Believe it or not, there are a lot of people out there who struggle to have these things. No matter where you live in the United States, you may see homeless people on the street. They're struggling. You may see people who don't have jobs. They're struggling. And so these are all things to think about, like, thank God I have this. Thank God I have this. Thank God I have, you know, heat and I have water and I have clothes and I have a family and I have, you know, loving parents. So let's look at a couple of well-known examples of conceptual reasoning to help you understand this concept better because it it is something that that I had to really think about myself and I've learned it through many years of helping caregivers and aging adults and I use it in my personal life but it's not something that just you know drops in your lap and comes to you and you're like oh yeah I know how to do this you have to work at it so let's go to the bible Matthew 13:12 and this is a quote To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given, and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. Now, you may hear that and you may think, oh, Pamela, what the heck does that mean? I thought that the first time I heard it. There's a lot of interpretations of what that means. Probably one of the simplest is that the teacher shows up when the student is ready. And it doesn't mean that you're a traditional student. It just means that the teacher, somebody helpful, somebody good in your life, shows up when you are ready for that person, when you ask for the help, when you admit that you have the need. Because if you think that you know everything, then you probably do. And no one is going to show up. So that statement, but for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. So you become closed-minded, right? When a person is prepared and open-minded to learn and receive information, even though that information may be different from your present circumstance or your beliefs or your knowledge, what happens is the universe, God, whoever you believe in, starts opening more doors for you. But you also have to be aware and attentive to the fact that a door is opening. So instead of saying no, and instead of rejecting everything that comes across your plate, no, I'm too busy, I don't have time for that, can't do that, stop saying no. Start saying yes. Start saying, how do I make that happen? How do I bring that into my life? Because again, we're looking at holding on to the good things and bringing more good things into our life. When you do that, doors open, opportunities happen, people cross your path, more opportunities to learn and expand your experiences and your knowledge are presented to you. Now, on the other hand, people who are closed-minded or judgmental 
are likely going to be limited to their judgments and negative thinking and no and failure and limitations and no opportunities. Now, as we all know, if we tried to do this, it can be really difficult to change the opinion who has some of somebody who has their mind made up regardless of anything. They're not motivated. They don't want to change. They don't want to hear new ideas. They don't want to hear new opinions. They're fine as they are, and they may be miserable as they are, but they're not ready to change. So for these people, holding on to the good things may not be possible because they don't believe any good exists or can exist in their life. They've lost hope. They've lost faith or belief that life can get better. Now, admittedly, some of these people may have a medical condition. They may be mentally ill. They may have a substance abuse addiction. They may have other problems that cause them from seeing the good and seeing the other side. But like everybody, until they choose or until they're in a situation where they can make a different choice, nothing's going to change. So if you want to hold on to good things in your life, if you want to create more experiences and more good, you have to be open-minded. If you're a busy caregiver and you want more free time, you must create small bits of free time in your day. Don't make excuses. Don't say you're too busy. Don't say you can't have, it can't happen. I'm too tired. I have a million other reasons. No, if you say that, you're never going to have more free time. Schedule it. Read a book for 30 minutes. Take a walk. Listen to music. Call a friend. Schedule and be intentional about making time to do and experience something good. Because if you do this and you believe, you will create more free time and good things in your life. As a caregiver, admit that you can't do it all. Ask for help. The process of asking the universe or God for help will have help show up in unexpected ways in your life. I've had caregivers who found videos on my YouTube channel at two o'clock in the morning. I've had caregivers who asked for help and they found my website, PamelaDWilson.com. Ask for help. Keep asking for help. But make sure that when that help is offered, you don't shut the door. You open the door and walk through. Accept for responsibilities to look for opportunities to make changes in your life. This doesn't mean that you are going to, you know, toss your life upside down and abandon the person that you care for, because that person that you care for also has to accept responsibility for their life and how they got there. If they want to change it, they have to do something to make it change as caregivers or as anybody in life. Being too helpful to other people can place greater burden on ourselves and it takes away the opportunity for other people to work through and figure out their lives and solve their own problems. Caregivers can become resentful of other people who don't jump to help in. Well, why should they? Did you ever think that other people are not supposed to jump in and help you? Because there is a lesson for you to learn about setting boundaries or problem solving or working through relationships or changing your behaviors. If you have disagreeable people in your life, this could be the person you care for. You may be the disagreeable person. Learn how to handle conflict. Learn how to respond positively to other people that you might see as insulting or condescending or egotistical. Stop being critical of other people. This is a very hard lesson to learn depending on how you were brought up and your life circumstances and everything that's happened before today. In very simple terms, it's that idea of turning the other cheek and walking away from a situation so that you don't create more of this thing that you don't want in your life, this thing that you don't like. Holding on to the good things means being more intentional and insightful about our actions. Catching ourselves when we start to say something negative or criticize somebody else or say something bad. We have to just stop ourselves. Because if we purposely hurt somebody else's feelings, what is that? Why are we intending to be mean or hurtful? What what do we get out of that? I mean, it may make us feel better, but it's only going to bring more of that into our life. Do you want other people to act that way 
to you. And I know it's hard to learn to walk away, to bite your lip, to not say anything. But learning to take the high road, I have a video about this on my YouTube channel, learning to take the high road a little bit at a time, one step at a time, will go a long way to creating more good in your life. This behavior, cruel behavior, adversive behavior in society has almost become an acceptable habit. If you're out and you hear the news, you know it. The daily news is full of inconsiderate and divisive conversations that promote one person over another, one way of thinking over another. The news is trying to convince people that other people are bad or they are out to get you. This is not true. But it's where those people who are having the conversation, it's where they live. It's where their minds are. So refuse to be swayed by these types of conversations. Instead, be compassionate. Try to understand the needs of other people. Try to understand both perspectives by actually doing research to understand the perspectives. Ask people why they think the way they do if it's different than you. The people that you spend the most time with contribute to the circumstances in your life. The good things or the bad things. There's that old saying, as you sow, so you shall reap. Become a kind person. Become a peacemaker so that you can create and find more peace in your life. Be kind to others so that your actions contribute to ending this cruel behavior in society, ending anger, hostility, aggression, frustration. Work to not overreact to situations or the actions of other people that maybe you can't understand for one reason or another. Instead of focusing on feeling stressed, ah, oh, I'm so busy, I have all this to do, or any other habit in your life that you do not want, focus on the reasons you want to do or be the opposite and start acting that way. Most of all, do your best to work through or avoid situations that put you in those positions where you don't want to be or even those that are tempting. Tempting, simple example, you want to stop drinking. Don't spend time at a bar. Don't go to a liquor store. If you want to be healthy, get up off the couch, exercise, join a hiking group, activity group. If you want more friends, go to social activities where you can meet people. Change to having more good in our life. Creating more good takes effort. And it can be scary. It can be hard. It can be difficult to change our own behaviors. But it's worth it when you arrive on the other side and you're seeing more good in your life and you're saying, oh my gosh, this is actually working. Don't allow your mind to get stuck on all those things that you see as past mistakes and reasons that you can't do stuff. See more of the actions for what you want and move forward. Take accountability. Free yourself from guilt by acting to get happier, acting to get more blessings in your life, being more thankful, having more friends, all that stuff that you want. So earlier in the show, I mentioned this example of being in a workplace where you don't feel like you're a good fit with the culture. That may be, it may not be. Many people do feel out of place or that they didn't make a good choice when they took a job. But when you think about that, before you run off to seek a new situation, or really any situation, it could be a relationship that you think is not working, right? Take the time to think about the choice that you made and your actions and the results and how what you're doing is contributing to the situation that you don't like, especially if you want to choose different the next time. So is it at all possible for you to stay in the current situation and do a little test, change your behaviors and thought patterns, start acting differently? Remember that what we put in, we get out of relationships, out of the workplace, out of our career. How might what you're putting in or what you're putting out affect the way other people react back to you? Really give this some thought. And then truly, if you feel that you have to make a choice, think differently. Think how am I going to evaluate this new choice? 
Last time I evaluated it this way, my mindset was this. I was trying to avoid all these things, right? Trying to avoid things is different from trying to bring good things into your life. So your evaluation measures should be positive. It should be things that you want. And sometimes it's just not easy to see how our thoughts and our actions can contribute to a situation. This is where time can make a difference. Time for thought, time for reflection, even time to ask other people how you, your behaviors come off to them. It can lead to a realization that it's really us that has to change. And through this change, our surroundings will change, our circumstances will change, others will react more positively to us, good things will start coming into our life. There is so much to think about for holding on to the good things and creating more good in our life. If you're looking for caregiver support, if you're looking to join an online caregiver support group, consider joining my group on Facebook. It's called The Caregiving Trap. You can also visit my website, PamelaDWilson.com, to take an online caregiver course. You can watch a few hundred videos on my YouTube channel. Listen to over 160 podcasts of The Caring Generation. Start today to hold on to the good things and create more good in your life. I'm Pamela D. Wilson, caregiving expert, advocate, and speaker, sending you all blessings and positive thoughts. I hope you have a fabulous week until we are all here together again. And please share this podcast with other people that you know who are looking for hope, help, and support. Have a great week. Tune in each week for The Caring Generation with host Pamela D. Wilson. Come join the conversation and see how Pamela can provide solutions and peace of mind for everyone. Here on Pamela D. Wilson's The Caring Generation.